children at this time for Children's Church. There's Karen. You can just follow her. I was joking ahead of time this, uh, today, you, you people in first class here, you need to tithe double. Did you get that? <laughs> I'm teasing. These are for the claustrophobic people in the crowd. You've got plenty of wide open spaces here today. Well, it's really good to be in the house of the Lord, and we are still in the month of February. And in February, I, I'm usually on kind of a love theme, and uh, the, Today is no exception. If you didn't happen to see last Sunday's sermon, um, let me encourage you to check it out because really it's, it is the basis of what it means to be a Christian. It's the basis of the Christian life, the standard, love one another as I have loved you, and the test, of course, is whether or not we do it in action. And so let me encourage you to check out last Sunday's message because it kind of lays the groundwork uh, for today. Our text is found in 1 John 4, 7 through 11, if you'd like to go there. 1 John 4, starting with verse 7, it says, Dear friends, let us love one another. Now, if you caught last Sunday's message, you heard that, that the Apostle John, when he was in old age, he was so weak that he had to be carried to the church meetings. At the end of every meeting, he'd be helped to his feet to give a word of exhortation to the church. Can you imagine having the Apostle John in your service to come up and give a word of exhortation? Well, he, he had hardly any strength left, and, and usually he only said these words, let us love one another. And they asked him, why do you always say that? His, this was his response. Because it's the Lord's command... And if only this is done, it is enough. Wisdom from the old apostle John. If only this is done, it is enough. And that's scriptural because when they asked Jesus what was the greatest commandment, he said, love God, love your neighbor. All of the commandments hang on these. So back to our text. 1 John 4, 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. Think about that for a minute. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed His love among us. See, God showed His love. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. He initiated it. He was the one that was wronged, and yet he initiated the reconciliation. I don't think it's accidental that the Bible says that the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom, not bottom to top. God came down to us, gave his son as an atoning sacrifice, and since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Then over in 1 John 3, 16, if you want to back up just a little bit there, this is how we know what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Sometimes we talk about dying for one another, and we say we'd be willing to do that. Sometimes I wonder if that wouldn't be easier than living for one another, to lay down our lives daily. That's, that's what love is, to lay down our lives. Well, I hope you all had a happy Valentine's Day. I wish we could have been together last week, but sitting there in my flannel by the uh, fireplace wasn't too bad either. I hope you got to catch that. Valentine's Day. Webster defines a Valentine as a gift or greeting sent to someone special almost always contains a message of love or affection that the sender has for the receiver. Well, based on that, God has repeatedly expressed His love and affection for us, so you might say that God has sent us a valentine. So as I want to look at it that way today. The title of the message is God's Valentine. First of all, the expressions of God's love. He has expressed His love for us 
from the very beginning, first of all in creation. He, he created a perfect environment and he placed us in it and he looked and he said, everything is good. Everything in creation was good. That was before it was defiled. He, he expressed his love for us when he saw that it was not good for man to be alone. So he created woman. He expressed his love when he spared Noah and his family from the flood so that they could replenish the earth. He expressed his love in Jesus' birth when he came to earth to be a man. The, at, it left me, incarnation. <laughs> Had one of those brain freezes there for a minute. When, when God came and inhabited flesh, the incarnation was an expression of God's love for us. He expressed his love in the life of Jesus, Acts 10, 38. Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil. He expressed his love in the death of Jesus, John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. He expressed his love in the resurrection, John 14, 19. Jesus said, because I live, you also will live. So God has repeatedly, down through the ages, expressed His love for us in various ways. And aren't you glad for the resurrection? Because He lives, I too shall live. He so loved that He what? He gave. What did He give? His only begotten Son, the very best that He had. That's how God showed His love for us. When did he do it? According to Romans 5, 8, he did it while we were still sinners. You know, the Bible says that you might lay down your life for a friend, for someone that you loved. But God did it when we were still sinners, when we were still enemies, when we were still estranged from him. That's when he did it. He built a bridge to us, even though we didn't deserve it, even though we had sinned and fallen short. That's how much he loves us. The Living Bible says it this way in Ephesians 2. God is so rich in mercy. He loved us so much that even though we were spiritually dead and doomed by, by our sins, he gave us back our lives when he raised Christ from the dead. Only by his undeserved favor have we ever been saved. That's quite a valentine if you want to look at it that, that way. His expression of love for us. Now here's the point number two, if you're taking notes. He expects us to deliver his valentine. Now what if you, I don't know if you remember the elementary days when everyone had a valentine box. You decorated it up and you gave valentines to each other. What if you were, you were a little bit shy, but you had a sweetheart and you gave your valentine to someone else and said, would you give it to them for me? And then at the end of the day, you said, uh, well, did you deliver my valentine? Nah, never got around to it. <laughs> That'd be aggravating, wouldn't it? You went to all this trouble to, to make it all nice and pretty, and then, and then they gave it to someone to deliver, and they didn't deliver it. Well, you know, God, if you want to call his gospel, his expression of love, a valentine, he's delivered it to us. And then he has asked us to deliver it to the world, to pass it on, to go into the world and spread the good news, to share his valentine. 1 John 4, 11, since he loved us, we ought to love one another. I hope God didn't waste his love on us. He lavished his love. He was extravagant with his love. He poured it into us. Is, are we going to let it stay there? Or are we going to share it? I've been to the Dead Sea. I see what happens when things do not flow. When it stops. We want, when God sheds His love abundantly into us, we need to let it flow out to others. But what, what is His kind of love? Last week I talked about Eros and Storge and Phileo, those, those men kind of loves, those conditional loves. God's love is an agape love. It's unconditional. And Paul fortunately described it, described it for us in one of the most familiar passages in all of the New Testament, the love chapter. 
1 Corinthians 13, he tells us what it looks like. Very clearly, he said it's patient. It's kind. It's not jealous. It doesn't boast. It's not arrogant and it's not rude. It doesn't think about itself. It's not irritable. It doesn't keep track of wrongs. It's not happy when injustice is done. It's happy with the truth. Never stops being patient, never stops believing, never stops hoping, never gives up. But that's what we're talking about. I don't know if you've ever sat there and just meditated on those qualities and kind of compared and says, do I love like that? Do those qualities describe my relationships with other people? Do they describe my relationships with my spouse or my siblings or my children or my parents? Is that what it looks like? Probably most of us would probably confess that we fall a little short sometimes. Maybe a lot short. The Living Bible says it this way. It doesn't demand its own way. It's not irritable or touchy. Is anybody ever irritable? You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> Are you easily offended? Do you get your feelings hurt easily? It doesn't hold grudges. Somebody come to mind right now that uh, you're carrying a grudge for? It'll hardly even notice when others do it wrong. Why is that? Because it's not concerned with me. It's not concerned with myself, my feelings. Things like injustice and offenses and things like that, it just kind of bounces off because that's not really what I'm about. I'm not about myself. It'll hardly even notice. Let that sink in. It's number one, patient. That's love in a frustrating situation. That's how love behaves when the situation is frustrating. 1 Thessalonians 5.14 says, Be patient toward all men. Of course, that's in the generic sense. That means all mankind, all people. Galatians 5.22 says, Patience is a fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Abraham Lincoln modeled it for us. From his earliest days in politics, he had a critic by the name of Edwin Stanton. Edwin Stanton was always slandering Lincoln. He'd say terrible things to reporters. He'd come out in the newspapers. He'd call him ugly names. But Lincoln always took the high road. He never responded. He never retaliated. And when he became president, guess who he picked for his Secretary of War? Edwin Stanton, his worst enemy, his greatest critic. Someone said, why'd you do that? He said, because he was the best man for the job. After Lincoln was assassinated, Stanton looked upon the face of his dead president and said through his tears, there lies the greatest ruler of men the world has ever seen. Stanton's animosity had been broken by Lincoln's patient, long-suffering, non-retaliatory love. It's amazing what love can do. We live in an impatient world. Any arguments there? I hate stoplights. I go down to Ar northwest Arkansas, how, probably... Almost every time I go down there, I say, why would anyone want to live here? <laughs> I don't get it. You go a little bit and you stop. You go a little bit and you stop. You're, you want to turn, but no, there's too many cars. I don't like that. I like being able to go where I want to go unimpeded. I'm impatient in that way. I get tired of waiting on a microwave. I can't imagine what it would. <laughs> Oatmeal, one and a half minutes. Who's got that kind of time? <laughs> We, we're impatient with waitresses, store clerks, family members, other drivers. One of my pet peeves is people honking at me. I hate that. When I was driving in Times Square, downtown New York, I decided right away I'm going to have to put that aside. <laughs> because, because that's all they do. They just honk for no reason. They just honk. I don't know why. 
Sometimes we get impatient with ourselves. Do you ever just want to kick yourself? I used to be able to kick myself, but I can't. I, but we need patient, patience in this world. Love is patient. And saying, I'm, well, I'm just an impatient person, that's no excuse. Sorry. God's a patient God. Jesus is a patient Savior, and the Holy Spirit enables us to be patient. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and the Bible says patience is a fruit of the Spirit. So I don't have any excuses. The Holy Spirit's on board. That means I have everything I need for life and godliness. I can be patient, even when that light won't turn green. Love's also kind. That's love in action. That's how love behaves itself. It's kind. 1 John 3, 18, let's not love with words or tongue, but with actions and truth. You say you love, prove it. Kindness is the outworking of love. Patience is the passive side. Kindness is the active side. To be kind is to be gracious, easy on other people, to help carry their load. I love it when I go into a store and they say, how may I help you? I like that. That's positive. We need to look at people that way. How may I help you? How may I lighten your load? How may I show the fruit of the Spirit in me through my acts of kindness? Romans 2, uh, 12, 10 says, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor giving preference to one another. Ephesians 4, 32 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ in Christ, God forgave you. You see, patience and kindness are aspects of God's love, mercy, and grace. Mercy means that God does not give us the judgment we deserve, and grace means that God gives us the blessings we don't deserve. Patience, kindness. That's how God treats us, and that's how we should treat other people. Jesus illustrated it this way in Matthew 25, 35. He said, I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in. I needed clothes, you clothed me. I was sick, you looked after me. I was in prison, you came to visit me. The righteous said, when did we do all of that? He said, when you did it for the least of these, you did it for me. You see, Jesus isn't here in his physical body, but we can serve him by serving others. We can be kind to him by being kind to others. An elderly mother was confined to her home. She said, I've got two daughters who take turns cleaning my home. Jean comes and makes everything shine, but she leaves the impression that I'm a burden. Mary comes, no matter how low my spirit, she's so cheery, she cheers me up. She makes me feel like she loves me. They're both Christians, but the difference is in their attitude. Mary has that extra touch of grace. You see, there's a difference in serving and having the heart of a servant. There's a difference in performing acts of service and actually being a servant. What is our attitude about helping others? Do we assist people grudgingly, making them feel like a burden, or do we demonstrate heartfelt concern that leaves them uplifted and blessed? Well, that's what love is. It's patient and kind. Then, then Paul switches to what love is not. He defines it in the negative. He said it's not envious. We need the attitude of Sir Walter Scott. When Lord Byron's poems were first published, a reviewer who remained anonymous at the time said, in the presence of such genius, it can no longer be said that Sir Walter Scott is the leading poet of his day. Guess who wrote that? Sir Walter Scott. He wasn't envious. He wasn't competitive. Love's not boastful and self-promoting. There are two types of people in the world, those who say, here I am, and those who say, there you are. And it's pretty easy to tell the difference. 
People may forget what you say, they may even forget what you do, but they will not forget how you made them feel. Uh, love is not proud and self-exalting. It's not puffed up. It doesn't say I'm better than you. It doesn't have an inflated idea of its own importance. It's not rude. Love has good manners. I've heard missionaries say that they can go into the darkest, most uncivilized, barbaric regions of the world, and when people get saved, they all of a sudden begin to adopt good manners. It's the craziest thing. Because that's how love acts. It's not self-seeking. It's not preoccupied with its own rights. Don't you get tired of hearing people standing up for their rights? I mean, it's like that's the number one goal is that my rights. That's not agape. 1 Corinthians 10, 33, Paul said, I'm not seeking my own good, but the good of many so that they may be saved. And then he goes on to say, follow my example. 1964 Olympics. Italy's team was heavily favored in the two-man bobsled event. The lightly regarded British team broke an axle bolt. It seemed certain they would have to drop out. But after their second run, the highly favored Italians stripped the bolt from their own sled and offered it to the British. One of the greatest upsets in Olympic history, the British actually won the gold. While the sportsmanlike Italians finished third. Four years later, both the two-man and the four-man Italian sleds cruised to Olympic victory. Their payoff was just four years later. But they did the right thing. Love is not self-seeking and it's not irritable. It's not easily provoked. It doesn't have a short fuse. It doesn't get angry at the slightest provocation. A loving person's not touchy. They're not easily offended. You don't have to feel like you're walking on eggshells around them. <laughs> the wife of a particularly hard to please husband, was determined. I'm going to fix a breakfast that he can't possibly complain about. So she asked him, darling, what would you like for breakfast this morning, sweetheart? He growled, coffee and toast, grits and sausage and two eggs, one scrambled and one fried. She soon had the food on the table, waited for a reaction. After a quick glance, he said, well, if you didn't go and scramble the wrong egg. <laughs> That's not agape. That's not what I'm talking about. Love is not irritable. And it's not bitter. It doesn't take into account when others do it wrong. The word for bitter was sometimes used by bookkeepers to mean keeping a ledger. Keeping score, keeping a scorecard. Love doesn't keep a scorecard. Try it. It makes life so much easier. You don't have to keep score. You don't have to keep track. You don't have to try to remember who said bad things about you and who posted ugly stuff on Facebook and who didn't wave when you see, saw them and who didn't pay their debt. You just God says, vengeance is mine. I'll repay. I'm the scorekeeper. You let me handle it. <sighs> It's just such a relaxed way to live. After the Civil War, Robert E. Lee visited the lady who showed him the remains of her beautiful oak tree in the front of her house. She bitterly cried that its limbs and trunk had been destroyed by federal artillery fire. She looked to Lee for a word condemning the North, or at least sympathizing with her loss. After a brief silence, Lee said, Cut it down and forget it. <laughs> that wasn't the response she was looking for. Lee said, cut it down and forget it. It's better to forgive the injustices of the past than to allow them to remain and let bitterness take root and poison the rest of your life. When you hold bitterness, you're not hurting anyone as badly as you're hurting yourself. A grandmother 
celebrating her golden wedding anniversary, once told the secret of her long and happy marriage. She said, on my wedding day, I decided to make out a list of my husband's 10 worst faults. And I determined that I, I'm not going to hold those against him. And uh, I guess I asked the woman, what were some of those faults that she had chosen to overlook? She said, well, to tell you the truth, I never got around to making the list. She said, every time my husband did something that made me mad, I just said, boy, he's lucky that's on the list. <laughs> Love doesn't delight in evil. It's not happy about the misfortune of others. It gets no satisfaction out of that. It rejoices with the truth. So... Paul told us what love is, and then he told us some things that love is not, and now he comes back to what love is. Again, the positive side, it's, it's protective. Love has eyelids as well as eyes. Proverbs 10 12 says, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. It has eyelids. It knows how to overlook. An artist was commissioned to paint the portrait of Alexander the Great. Alexander had been wounded in battle and had an ugly scar on his face. And the artist was trying to figure out how to cover up the scar and still be honest and realistic in his rendering. So he posed Alexander with his finger thoughtfully placed over the scar. That's what love does. It overlooks. Don't you want someone's love to cover your faults, your shortcomings? Then you should do it the same for others. Love's protective. It sees others in a favorable light. I read the neatest story a week or two ago. A, teacher, a student came up to one of his former teachers and he said, I want you to know it's because of you that I am what I am today. And he says, oh, why is that? And he said, well, when I was in your class, I stole the watch. And the watch was reported missing. And you had everyone close, your eye, close their eyes. You went around and searched the pockets. You found the watch. You announced that the watch had been found. Everyone could open their eyes. But you never revealed my name. It made an impact. And from that day on, I determined that I was going to be a better person. He said, do you remember me? And he said, I remember the incident, but I don't remember you because I had my eyes closed. That's what love does. It's protective. It overlooks others' faults and shortcomings. It's trusting. Adam stayed out late. Eve was upset. He said, she said, have you been running around with other women? He said, Eve, that's crazy. You're the only woman in the world. <laughs> he woke up in the middle of the night with someone poking him in the chest. And he said, what are you doing? She said, I'm counting your ribs. <laughs> that's not trust. Love is trusting. It's hopeful. It looks for the best in other people. Had it not been for his loving wife, Sophia, we might not have heard the name Nathaniel Hawthorne. When Nathaniel, a heartbroken man, went home to tell his wife he was a failure and he'd been fired from his job, she surprised him and said, Now you can write your book. And what shall we live on while I'm writing it, replied the man with sagging confidence. To his amazement, she opened a drawer and pulled out a substantial amount of money. Where on earth did you get that, he exclaimed. I've always known you were a man of genius, she told him. I knew that someday you would write a masterpiece. So every week out of the money you gave me for housekeeping, I, gave, I saved a little bit, so here's enough to last us for a whole year. From her trust and confidence came one of the greatest novels of American literature, The Scarlet Letter. One of the many books that I was supposed to have read in high school. <laughs> the Scarlet Letter. When most people who've achieved great things in their lives tell their story, 
they mention those who encouraged them along the way. There's usually someone who encouraged them. Aspire to inspire before you expire. Aspire to be that encourager. Aspire to be that one that encourages someone to be all that they can be. That's what love does. It's hopeful. It expects the best. It's also enduring. Love is enduring. A speaker held up a sheet of paper, and he asked his crowd, what do you see? Of course, everyone said, a sheet of paper. And then, he made a mark on it, and he said, now what do you see? They said, well, we see a dot. What's well, the same sheet of paper? Let that dot represent a person's greatest fault. You could concentrate on that dot if you want, and you can see only that dot, and you could define that person by their dot, or you could define them by all of their other redeeming qualities because they are the still they're still the same person that they were before you discovered their dot. That's what love does. It protects, it trusts, it hopes, it perseveres. God delivered his valentine to us, and now it's our job to deliver it to others. 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, these three remain. Faith, man, faith. Without faith can't please God. That's a tremendous thing. Hope. How, how does it get any better than hope? Faith and hope. Wow. Those are tremendous qualities. But he says love is the greatest. The greatest of these is love. If you go out these doors and you intentionally love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, you have done absolutely everything that God has asked you to do on this earth. Let me challenge you to do it. Shall we stand? Father, we thank you for February. We thank you for St. Valentine that set the example. And we're thankful for the holiday that uh, reminds us that really it is all about love, the basis of the Christian life. It's loving you, loving people. And we just pray, Lord, that uh, you'd help us to do that, that you would so fill us with your spirit that all uh, remnants of selfishness and self-centeredness and carnality and all those ugly things would be purged and only your spirit would remain that your love would shine through. Thank you for these that have come today. We just pray, Lord, that you'd watch over them, protect them, and uh, bring them back to the appointed time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.